Amen. Please arise in body or spirit and turn your spirits to the cross. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Please remain standing as you're able for our opening hymn, number 720, in the center section of your red hymnal.
Let us pray. Gracious God, throughout the ages you transform sickness into health and death into life. Open us to the power of your presence and make us a people ready to proclaim your promises to the whole world. Through Jesus Christ, our healer and Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 to 7. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear, here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. The word of the Lord. The psalm today is Psalm 146, found in your bulletin. We will read it by alternate verses. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no help. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, 
whose hope is in the Lord their God. Keep their promises forever. Who give justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion. The second reading is from James chapter 2, verse 1 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, well, to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and the heirs of the kingdom that he promised for those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you, it is not who drag you into the court. Is it not they who blast for me the excellent name that is invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partially, you commit sin and are convicted by law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So you speak and, act, and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works, can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, no one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. We're going to continue with our gospel acclamation in setting eight. It's found on page 188, the Alleluia, in the front section of your hymnal. And I invite you to arise in body or spirit. This is the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From there, Jesus sent, set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. 
Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears and spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Friends, grace and peace to you from God the Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So much to celebrate today. I love the yellow t-shirts. Um, we're going to be loud and proud and almost obnoxious in our golden rod out there in the community today. I think as we go forward, we'll plan to do that more and more to wear these bright yellow t-shirts. They sure do seem to catch a lot of attention, and that's a good thing, right? Helping your neighbor doesn't make the kind of headlines as blowing them up, up does, but that's the work that we're about, reaching out and serving our neighbors. And we're coupling it today with the kickoff of our stewardship campaign, which to me, blends perfectly together because, again, we know that we are midway points of God, God's grace and blessings, and our job is simply to continue to pass them along, to worship God, to enjoy fellowship, to learn together, and to serve. And that's what we're about. But I always preach from the gospel. And if you're anything like me, and you hear this gospel or you read it, there are a couple of points that make you pause and go, that's weird, or unfortunate, or gross, and so let's talk about it. We'll start today with a couple of kind of difficult questions. These are questions that colleagues like Vicar Natalie and I engaged with through the week as we uh, tried to figure out what's at the bottom of this? What's at the foundation of these two healing miracles which are decidedly connected together? It brought up questions like, can Jesus learn? Can Jesus change his mind? Is Jesus open to new and different ideas? Probably the traditional view about Jesus would say, no, no, and no. Jesus is perfect. He's all-knowing. He's the embodiment of uh, the universal Christ, and so he always knows what's coming next. He always knows what's going to happen and how he's going to react, and things like that. In fact, I would tell you that Pastor Ben of 10 years ago had preached this very text. I'm going to call it in the remote or ancient past now. It's mostly been lost to history. But it said something like, Jesus really knows how to set up a lesson. Jesus has nothing to learn. Jesus is always perfect. He does know what's coming next. And this exchange with this Syrophoenician woman is just a ploy to show that Gentiles can be faithful too. He sets it all up perfectly. But I found that re-examining things that I feel sure about, especially matters of faith and interpretation, wrestling with those things and praying and scrutinizing them for myself is really important. I found that even foundational beliefs can change, and that you can't really have faith in anything you know for sure. You can't really have faith in anything you know for sure, and it's important to be open. I would encourage you to do the same. And if you find yourself in this moment exactly the same place and position on all matters of faith as you were 10 years ago, including things like politics, social justice, overall worldview, to be open to new and different ideas. Otherwise, life can get pretty boring, I would think. Because at this point, I read this gospel passage, two miraculous healings. I can see that they are inextricably tied together by the theme of being 
open. And they work well together so much because Jesus himself is willing to be open. And being open is a good thing, right? Think of being open as being a good thing. Open, I guess, in our context typically means um, more affirming, more welcoming, more, you know, things like that. But I've noticed, too, as I've been paying attention for this word out in the world, that we kind of have an odd relationship with the idea of being open. I'm thinking like political buzzwords or phrases like open borders that immediately make us feel vulnerable and lawless. If you pay attention to updates in technology, maybe you've heard about open source AI. Half of you are gonna stop paying attention. So just, it's not really that open, okay? Those of you who know, it's not really that open. I've noticed that the open championships in, there's the tennis one and the golf one, and you would think that they're open for anybody to participate, but when you really pay attention, it's just a tiny fraction of the very, very best that are invited to come and play, so not all that open. But we are focused today on being open as a good thing, a willingness to be changed, a willingness to move from the familiar to something new, a willingness to grow. And that's exactly what Jesus offers a deaf man. In my own thinking and praying and preparation this week, I realized that maybe the best way to compare these stories and tie them together is to flip-flop them and to look at the conversation with the man who was deaf and who had speech uh, issues in his life. And so this is exactly what Jesus offers a deaf man. He has a speech disorder in the region of the Decapolis, still a Gentile, still an outsider, still unclean as far as Jesus' religion would teach. And he does so in such a fascinating way. Did you know that in the Gospels, there's really only a few instances where Jesus, as he's recorded in the Gospel, breaks away from the cultural Greek language and speaks in his own hometown Aramaic language that would have far predated the Greek. Remember, these folks speak at least three or four different languages. But there are these few moments when Jesus breaks away from the Greek and his words are recorded in Aramaic. It seems to add a personal touch. It seems to add a deep and abiding history. It seems to add for today, for example, that Jesus is not just healing someone, but fulfilling the words of the prophet Isaiah, as the deaf can hear and the mute can speak. Today, he uses the word ephatha. It is an Aramaic word. He also uses it in the Garden of Gethsemane when he calls God Abba, which is not as much father as it is daddy. It is deeply affectionate. As he raises a girl, he says Talitha kum, which means rise up. Of course, when he's hanging on the cross in this deeply personal and horrific moment, he says Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that's Aramaic for, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we know that these moments are important and we'd better listen up. Ephatha, a word that is fascinating. It means to be opened. It's actually kind of a play on words. It's based on the ancient understanding that those who cannot hear, their ears are literally closed. And those who cannot speak, their tongue is literally closed inside of their mouth. And so when he says, be opened, he is unstopping all that is keeping this man from living his life in community. He's bringing down the barriers that kept him from hearing the prayer and the laughter and the sacred stories of those around him. He can now hear them and he can now tell them. And he can hear Jesus himself speak of God's love for him as a person. So we take this and we're equipped now with the beautiful idea of ephatha, be opened. We circle back to the conversation with the Syrophoenician woman. And if we started with some kind of difficult questions like, can Jesus learn? Can Jesus change? Can Jesus change his mind? Now we have to ask an even harder question. Can Jesus be mean? Kind of sounds like it. 
Now again, we can work really, really hard, and we have for centuries to explain this away, or let Jesus off the hook, or preach things like, you know, when Jesus says it's not fair to take the children's food and give it to the dogs, to the woman who's asking for his help, the word dogs is more like puppy. It's really kind of an endearing thing. Come on. No. Nope. It's a put down. It's meant to be. We could simply remember that Jesus was fully human and under an enormous amount of stress and that the embodiment of the universal Christ just simply does not take issue with being corrected. We expect that he wouldn't. We put that on him, we project that, but he doesn't seem to have any issue with it. And so he talks with this foreign woman and she teaches him in an inspiring way. As she says, Jesus, please be open to me, a Gentile. Please be open to me, a woman. Please be open to me, a Syrophoenician woman. Please be open to me, someone who has grieved to her core over her child. Be open to me, who simply asks for a crumb. Be open to the idea that crumbs can make a difference. And Jesus is open. He heals her daughter, and he never calls someone a dog ever, never, ever again that we know of. Jesus is open, and he teaches us to be the same. I was chatting with a, a friend, old friend, colleague now, United Methodist pastor up in Illinois. We were just kind of comparing notes on some things, and we started talking a little bit about this idea of being open. And he said, well, I had a revelation recently. Now we know that the United Methodist Church has gone through so many of the same struggles that we have about identity and purpose and what's that issue that's finally gonna cause us to splinter away and, and poof out. But we got to talking about it and he said, I had a revelation recently. Here in the United Methodist Church, our motto is, just like ours is God's work, our hands. The motto in that denomination is open minds, open hearts, open doors. He said, the revelation that I had is that when we say open mind, open hearts, open doors, this is not an adjective. We're not describing who we are as a church because then we would have an issue. Are our hearts and minds really open? Are our doors really open to all? Not everywhere they're not. He said it's not a describing word, it's a verb. It is who we are called to be as the church as we move forward. We are to open minds, our own and others. We are to open hearts, our own and others. We are to open doors eventually to all. Today I would add to that, not just open minds, hearts and doors, but also open hands. After all, it's God's work, our hands, Sunday today, and we kick off our stewardship drive. And I would say that having the posture of open hands is the powerful posture of those who follow Jesus and those who live into the calling to be Christian in a desperate world. Open to receive first. God always gives first. And so we are open to receive and we are open to give and serve. If we're open to receiving God's grace, then we remain open to loving who God loves and serving who God would have us serve. An open hand is a posture of peace. An open hand is a posture of love. An open hand is not clenched around a gun, you know, even after another school shooting this week, it's not clenched to our money or grabbing at resources as if enough for everyone is the myth and the zero-sum game is the reality. And so we come today all in need of God's grace in Christ and we come to be opened. We come with open hands outstretched to receive mercy and then to pass it along. We come that our hearts, minds, doors would all be opened to God to whom God loves. We come in prayer, we come to serve, we come to share. We come like Jesus, 
turns out, to be opened. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now gathered together with the whole Church of Christ on earth, let us recite the words of our, of our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the Church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. The response today is, your mercy is great. Awaken in our communities of faith a spirit of radical hospitality. Encourage our churches to celebrate and embrace people of diverse backgrounds, experiences, and abilities. Deepen our commitment to ecumenical and interreligious partnerships. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Bring forth water to nourish plants and animals in places suffering from drought. Renew our commitments to protect rivers, lakes, and streams, and make us good stewards of water in our homes and our community. Preserve wetland habitats and the creatures that make their homes there. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Inspire leaders of nations, cities, and tribes to lead with wisdom and humility. Bring, bring peace among peoples in conflict and strengthen global commitments to nonviolent solutions. Guide all who seek refuge from war to a safe haven. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Especially, we pray that you would be with Karen, Melba, Ray, Logan, Chuck, Dottie, Brooklyn, Trudy, Lori, Donna, Emma, Damon, Joanne, Valerie, Elizabeth, Susan, Thera, Shelley, Michelle, Michael, Tom, Kay, Helen, Jack, Ezra, Christine, the family of Jim DeRupa, the family of Bob Peary, and the family of Marlene Doherty. Comfort all who live with chronic illness. Surround them in your tender embrace and sustain all who provide ongoing care and support. Bring hope and healing to people struggling with addiction and nourish the spirits of all who are in recovery. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Nurture in all people the gift of your creating spirit. Inspire artists and musicians, woodworkers and quilters, poets and dancers. Revive those whose artistic wells have run dry and enliven all who doubt their creative talents. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for all who have died and now find their rest in you. May your faithful witness guide us in our daily life with you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Share a sign of peace together.
God of all creation, all you have made is good and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, full of your glory, Hosanna, Hosanna. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you to mercifully accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.